everyone, welcome to Fox and Media Digital. My name's Amy, today I'm joined by Richard Burrett, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Earth Capital. So welcome Richard, it's great to have you joining. Welcome. Thank you. So of course you spoke at TSAM ESG last year and to kick off 2023, we're doing our regular YouTube interviews. So today uh, we'll be talking about ESG and the current environmental themes at the moment in sustainable investing. So mm. just to get started, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Earth Capital? Yeah, so um, I, I, I'm um, a sort of banker originally by background. I've spent over, over I'd say, I was going to say over 30, but it's much closer to 40 years in um, sort of international finance, um, uh, banking and investment. Um, I'm a director and chief sustainability officer at Earth Capital. Um, uh, Earth Capital, um, as you may know, is an investment manager with a real focus on um, sustainable investment and, and I guess our, our sort of investment themes are driven by the fact that you know we live in a planet where energy food and water um, will become increasingly in demand driven by population increase and will also be challenged by climate change as an issue so so our areas of focus really try to address issues around um, around climate change and and I guess for me, I, I mean, I became um, a convert to the sustainability um, sort of um, sy sy systemic thinking, um, oh, probably 15 plus years ago when, when I was a banker at ABN AMRO and we got involved in developing the equator principles, which was one of the first attempts in the banking sector to sy systematically look at um, environmental and, and social risk drivers. So um, for me, it's been quite a long journey in sustainability. Well, it's great. Well, I know that some asset managers, investment managers are a bit slow to the game. You know, it's taken off in the past few years, but like you say, Earth Capital really does focus on that. And that's been a highlight of your career for a while. Um, so can we just drill in on some of those environmental themes? Because I know it very much leads a lot of your strategy and you look at very niche areas beyond just the obvious ones that we see in the yeah. news. Yeah, I mean, because um, as we know, there's this sort of background of, of political debate about the value of ESG and, and some people saying that ESG is actually a social movement um, uh, and therefore, you know, hard-nosed investment world shouldn't really look at it. Um, and that's certainly the case in North America. I mean, there's a strong narrative um, currently, which is anti-ESG. I look at it very differently. I, I, I think if you look at the, the, the current population of the planet, um, 8 billion or so, you look at the predictions that we're going to add another 2 billion people to that. You look at the current issues around um, energy, access to energy, and many hundreds and hundreds of millions of people have no access to primary energy. Um, they have limit, limited access um, to food. Um, water scarcity is becoming an issue. So I, I actually, you know, see these environmental issues as being fundamental to the investment um, world because um, the global economy is is dependent in so many ways on on the natural capital that exists uh, currently on our planet, um, and at the same time, the global economy is is using and arguably abusing that 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 natural capital um add to that the issue of climate change um uh, i don't know if you saw this week the world economic forum has put out its um its most recent global risk uh report and if you look at the short and, and sort of 10-year view of the biggest risks a lot of them center around climate change um both are failure to mitigate climate change but also our, our failure to adapt to climate change so you know when i look at that scenario um as well I, I see little real evidence in the investment world that investors are sort of systematically um thinking through that issue in a really meaningful way um so uh, again, you know, when you get back to ESG, um, I, I don't see it actually as as a sort of politicised social tool, as some people see it. 
I actually see it as a recognition that there are some very fundamental environmental issues out there that we need to think about in business and in investment, and we need to think about them in a meaningful way. Um, and I guess the social dimension as well. I mean, we know that income inequality um, is worsening and has worsened significantly um, in, in recent years. And I mean, there, there is a, a, an increasing narrative that that is also becoming a, a social stability, financial stability risk. So um, it's not just environmental issues. Uh, there, there are consequences for social stability as well. Um, which I think the business and investment world need to recognize and think about. Um, so um, I guess as my intro, um, when, when people start getting critical of ESG, I, I, I might say, yeah, we're not doing it particularly well, but the reasons for doing it are fundamentally important and we just need to find a better way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think right now in the global recession, you know, with food resources, water scarcity, as you say, and especially mm. the energy crisis, you know, a lot of those have become relatable for, you know, the average consumer as well, people outside of finance. I think this is a good time to shine a light yeah. on that. Um, and thinking about solutions to this, you know, and what the investment sector can be doing then. So what kind of projects and investments should they be channeling their capital in? You know, what kind of te climate technology is out there and what kind of solutions to the water problem are there? Because that's something that we don't talk about often on this channel. Yeah. Um, so um, if we look at sort of climate first, um, I mean, obviously, one of, one of the first areas that has got attention from an investment perspective is, uh, is, is the energy generation sector. How do we generate electricity? Because our ability to transition to a, um, to a low carbon economy is totally dependent on our ability, first and foremost, to um, transform our power generation sector into a green uh, generation. Um, so, I mean, there, there are so many opportunities, obviously, to invest in renewables, to invest in energy efficiency, uh, to invest in things that um, actually um, green our energy supply and uh, hopefully reduce our demand as well, which is pretty fundamental, because we know we're going to need more and more energy going forward. So unless we, we we actually make it um, low carbon, uh, then then you know we have no hope of transitioning the rest of the economy. On the rest of the economy side, um, from from a energy perspective, um, I think you know we're seeing some some interesting attempts in industry to uh, lower the carbon footprint of industry. Um, transportation sector is obviously a really critical one, the mobility sector. Um, there are opportunities to invest in, um, obviously, electronic vehicles, the charging infrastructure that goes around them. But there are other um, areas like hydrogen, which are, are, are really critical if we want to, um, you know, transition all of the sectors. Um, I look at agriculture as well, and, and you know, it's a sector we're interested in, um, production of food, um, I think that will have to be, you know, rev revolutionised over over the next um, over over the next few years. I mean, um, Jason Clay many years ago at the at the uh, WWF um, said that we need to produce more food in the next forty years than we've ever produced in the history of the planet. Um, I mean, that gives you an idea of the scale of the challenge. Um, I think there are seven or eight hundred million people at present who are undernourished in terms of their food yet we know in the western world many of us in particular uh, are, are over nourished in terms of calories and we probably waste around a third of the food we produce anyway so there are some real challenges that we need to address and i think the food sector is is beginning to think through some of those but um i think we're only really at the beginning of that journey and then you also said water. Um, I mean, the water sector and water security um, is, is in some respects overlooked, I think. Um, and you said it's probably not something that is you know, regularly discussed uh, in the context of ESG. We, we tend to start with climate change. Um, 
I mean, the predictions are that in, in, in the next couple of decades, up to 50% of the world's population may be in water stressed areas. Um, and, you know, water is clearly fundamental to, to, um, to life. Um, I think currently 70% of water goes into agriculture. So, I mean, the idea of addressing the food crisis without thinking about water is really critical. So, um, you know, the sort of investments you might see are investments in technologies that help us to save water, water efficiency. I mean, we we invest in one business, Propel Air, which is a, a low water toilet. It, it, it uses, I think, one sixth of the um, water of a conventional flush. So, you know, that's just one sort of small example of, of the sorts of investments you, you could make. We also need to look at water treatment. Um, and water recovery. I'm, I'm actually off um, to Saudi Arabia um, uh, at the weekend um, to talk at a desalination uh, conference there. And and clearly, desalination um, is you know one um, area of investment that countries in the Middle East have, have turned to. Um, but but that has issues, obviously, because it's highly energy intensive and and it produces sort of brine as a as a residue of the process, um, and and you know to do that sustainably um, will require massive investment to decarbonize desalination projects and and to find you know interesting ways to actually utilize the brine um, rather than um, disposing it back into the sea. So, you know, I, the, the, it's actually quite an exciting time in in these sectors to. Um, you know, try and identify how those sectors will have to change in the coming years um, to actually keep up with um, the population growth that we that we expect over the next two decades. Yeah, and given that um, that urgency, you know, like you say, to keep up with the population growth and to meet the sustainable development goals, you know, we all know that we're a little bit behind in terms of the targets. Do you think that investment firms and investors don't really need to worry about transition risk in that sense because we're so behind anyway like you said we're at the beginning of this journey and there's a lot of innovation needed so do you think that the transition will be smooth given that we're not actually on track um yeah that's uh, an interesting argument which i have heard before i mean people say well look if we don't transition quickly enough then transition risk isn't the problem the, the problem you have then of course is physical risk I mean, you know, climate change, if you if you look at sort of TCFD, um, climate risk comprises of the physical risk of either acute, um, you know, extreme weather events or whatever impacting us, impacting the economy, or chronic problems like drought developing over years. Um, now, if, if we don't transition quickly enough, then transition risk indeed will be lower but physical risks will be higher. Um, and and you, I think you need to see transition risk and, and um, physical risk of climate change as, as a spectrum. Uh, and um, frankly, uh, you know, when the physical risk gets greater, then at some point we will transition very rapidly, probably very abruptly. And that's when you'll have problems from an investment and business perspective. Um, that's when assets might be, you know, very quickly stranded because, you know, governments realise that they have to take abrupt action at that point in time. Transition risk becomes extreme. So um, I'm less optimistic about um, our slow uh, pace of change. Um, I, I, I actually think, um, you know, there is a, there is a narrative out there, as I said, that ESG is somehow a, a politicized um, series of, of things. Um, well, when I look at issues like climate change, water scarcity, um, you know, when you look at biodiversity loss, I mean, these aren't political things, these are scientific things. I mean, they, they are the product of scientific equations. Uh, um, they may be um, grabbed by politicians and politicized, but, but the science is the science. And I think you know business and investors have to have to wake up to this. I mean, I think it's why science-based targets, 
in, in, in one respect, have taken on with many uh, investors and, and businesses because they can understand the pure scientific logic of committing to a science-based target that you keep coming back to because it, it, in, in a sense, there is, um, there's an undeniable truth in science um, as opposed to the rhetoric of politicians or, or you know, people who, who, for various reasons, um, do not like the environmental and social movement um, and somehow think that we shouldn't be doing it um, and, and, and that um, companies shouldn't be mandated and required to do it. I think that's the real pushback that we're seeing, particularly in, in the US at present. Yeah, and just to add to your point as well, I had a little look on the um, the interactive graph of the six um, climate change scenarios, you know, that are often yeah. used in the industry. And it's it's fascinating because, as you say, when you look at the one that is sort of a steady pace for net zero and transition risk, it's just a nice, easy journey. But then when you have this delay and then that sudden panic reaction, it's, it's mm. almost just as bad as having transition risk, you know, at a different point in time. So I think, you know, that's something for companies to bear in mind that if they can get ahead now and take action now that it will be a much easier <laughs> journey well um, i think that's the, that's the advice we give to companies i mean you need to think about these issues and you need to be ahead of the game um and you need to plan your business in such a way that it is more resilient to you know potentially rapid changes that might come in the future uh and, and to me, that 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 makes sense um, for, for businesses and for companies to do, um, and certainly from an investment perspective, um, you know, if, if if you're looking at five or ten years, as we often do, in, in in particularly in a private equity area, because you tend to hold on to your investments for longer periods of time, I mean, there could be some radical changes over that time period in 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 the way we do things, and and you know, trying to think what those might be and and plan for them just just makes common sense to me at least yeah absolutely and thinking about what we can do now then to assess um esg performance and you know material impact on physical mm. risk transition risk and how it's how the portfolio is looking at for that long-term journey yeah. what can we be doing now and what are some of the strategies for achieving this that you you would recommend that firms put in place even if they have you know strong esg um, portfolios you know what what should they be doing to really think about the long-term impacts of their investments well I guess um you know what what we try to do is we look at um we have our own proprietary sort of ESG assessment tool called the earth dividend and we look at five sort of buckets of um of issues um around natural resources ecosystems pollution social economic issues and, and societal and governance issues and we, we basically try to think about how each business will fare um, over time around those issues and we try to identify areas of strength where they're actually making a positive impact because overall all of our investments have to have that net positive impact but we, we also try to identify the areas where there may be weakness or risk and, and work with the companies to um, to make them aware of those issues and, and you know where it makes commercial sense to actually do something about it. So for me, you know, I, I think investors should be thinking about their investing companies and asking the question, you know, what are the material risks and the material dependencies that that company has? How might they change over time? And what is the company doing to respond to those? And is it doing what it's doing in a meaningful way that is an adequate response um, to those potential threats? And, and if it's doing that, then, you know, I think you can be reasonably confident um, that the business is managing those issues. Um, I think... One of the problems I see with ESG is we've got really hung up on metrics and we've got really hung up on the need to standardize metrics so that everybody is using the same metrics and we can compare. And, you know, it's intuitively 
logical to do to want to do that because it would make life easier but in practice it's actually really difficult to do that and if we just look at one issue like climate change you know we can measure scope one two and three emissions of the business and we should be doing that in my view um but does that really tell us whether the business is future fit whether uh, it is actually um going to thrive in five or ten years time um around the issue of, of climate change and i'm not sure that those metrics actually tell you that so we need to have a more a more sophisticated um sort of assessment of of the business and and i guess my my main concern with um with what's happening in the sort of in the esg standardization debate is it almost becomes quite reductionist because you know we end up sort of looking at metrics that are quite simple because we can measure them um but, but my concern is does it really tell us what we need to know to make sensible judgments about the um about whether a business will thrive in the future um from a sustainability perspective and i and i wonder whether it does um mm -hmm. and the problem is with with my argument uh, and i i can see that problem it actually makes uh the job of esg assessment um quite messy because you know you can, it's difficult to standardize um and and the the s element um you know social issues um a lot of those are very difficult to measure um they're often um socially constructed sort of terms or indicators anyway um they're e easily politicized and it, it's really difficult um to, to come up with a agreed set of standards for that for that reason um We've seen the, the huge debates in the EU on, on the taxonomy, um, and that's fundamentally looking at, at you know, climate change related issues, green issues. But again, that's a very politicized debate as well about whether, you know, technologies like gas fired power stations are green or, you know, whether nuclear energy is green. And, and you know, there are arguments on both sides for that. So I, I, I actually think, standardization um in some respects whilst i understand why people want it it it's taking our eye off the real ball which is do are we genuinely asking the right questions about whether these companies will thrive in the future or indeed survive in the future um and and you know that that requires i think a lot more work uh and a lot more assessment of of different scenarios for the future as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite a conundrum and it's one I think that will never truly go away in ESG, especially when it comes to data and assessment, unfortunately. But I think that's, you know, that itself is a good question. You know, should regulators, yeah. in order to standardise, move away from metrics-based systems and think about case-by-case -case questions to ask that can help with that consistency yeah. across firms' own internal judgments on, you know, whether something's ESG credential good or bad. Um, so I think that's a really nice way to end the, the interview because I think we're running out of time. But thanks so much for shedding that insight. Obviously, I think that's a good way to leave investors thinking about how they assess their material risks moving forward. Um, so it's been great having your insight today and a little bit of your thoughts on climate change and how to get there sustainably. Um, so thanks for joining, Richard. And obviously, we'll catch up with you on the channel and at future events of ours. Great. Th thank you very much, Amy. And um, yeah, I'm sure we will uh, talk soon. Thank you. And thanks everyone for watching.